Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. Today we have a showdown between two dive watches that represent offbeat takes on their brand's mainstream model lines. We have the Tudor Black Bay P01 and the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter Commander's Watch. Let the games begin. Let's dive straight into this dive watch comparison with the Omega Seamaster because it debuted first. A 7,007 piece limited edition 41 millimeters in steel from the 2017 model year. It plays on the lore of James Bond and his link to the British Royal Navy, which is mutual as Omega during World War II sold over 100,000 timepieces to the Ministry of Defense, including the Royal Navy. So Bond was a commander in the Navy. Omega was a supplier to the Royal Navy. This watch unites those two threads of real and fictional history. The timepiece is 41 millimeters in diameter in stainless steel. It measures 13.4 millimeters thick, but if you include the NATO style strap, it is 16.5 millimeters thick, and from lug tip to lug tip, 47.5 millimeters with a 20 millimeter spacing between the lugs. You get a lot with the boxed set for this watch, including a strap tool and a full bracelet with a clasp and deployant. So this is a very well equipped watch. It also includes a little commander's ribbon in the tricolor of the strap and a box with brass fittings. It's quite impressive. The accessory set is superb and the boxed set has a great sense of occasion. So if you don't like the strap, you have another built-in option when you buy this watch. We'll throw it on my wrist, which is 16 centimeters in circumference. And you'll see that a NATO strap always wears larger. Now, you don't really get a good sense of how it fits because at the end of the day, uh, the watch is really only sized properly when it's strapped down. This gives you a good look though. As you can see, it's not a huge watch. It does sit a little thick because of the NATO strap, but that's the look with the NATO. It's not terribly broad across the wrist and on a more conventional strap. I could see this watch working on a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference, nor is it terribly thick as under 14 millimeters. It's almost a millimeter meter clear of the P01 in thickness without the strap. The strap is beautiful. NATO straps have a reputation for being fairly low rent, and this is one of the best ever made. Not only is the material thick and substantial, but it has this lovely metal hardware that's Omega branded, plus a conventional pin buckle. It doesn't have the gooseneck clincher that you find on a traditional NATO, which can add bulk and also complexity in securing. The case is simple, liar style lugs, alternating polish and satin, helium escape valve, crown guard structure, beautiful tapered and a little bit more graceful than the P01. And by that, I mean a lot more graceful. We have a 120 click bezel that features a ceramic insert. The red uh, swatch, the quarter that is red, the first 15 minutes, that's actually in red rubber for durability. Uh, the ceramic insert helps to guard against scratches and it gives way to a dial that features blued applique indices, blued skeleton hands, sometimes known as the James Bond hand because Pierce Brosnan, during his turn as 007, wore this model in its initial version during the 90s, and that featured the Omega Wave dial, the skeleton hands, the case profile, the bezel profile, right down to the shallow knurling. This watch is descended from the Brosnan era Bond watches, not so much the Planet Oceans of the Craig era. We have a dial that is made of white ceramic. You can just barely see zirconium oxide, the chemical formula below the hands. And we have a date disc that matches the color of the dial. We also have a 007 counterweight to the seconds hand and a feature that's easy to miss if you just investigate the watch casually. The number seven on the date disc is actually red for 007. The watch, as you can see, features a quick set date as well as hacking seconds. And this is the part where I pop off the case back so you can more easily see that for which you've paid. Now this is still part of the previous pre-2018 generation of Diver 300 meter. So it's still using the 2500 base movement. Fortunately, this one is decorated. An unusual look, it's converted to caliber 2507 get it, with the rifling motif that you see at the beginning of Bond films, if you know the, the pre-credit roll, and then there's that opening motif with the shot where he shoots the assassin, and you can see that rifling pattern in that sequence, and that's exactly what you get in lovely contrasting golden tones on the rotor, individual numbering, it is the commander's watch, and this is basically caliber 2500 in its final iteration. Automatic winding, 48 hour power reserve, free sprung for durability, pivoting on 27 joules. Uh, it is a watch with an anti-magnetic hairspring 
and it is a COSC certified Swiss chronometer. It's based on the ETA 2892A2. That in turn is converted into Omega Caliber 1120, which becomes the 2500, which became the 2507. And so that is the lineage of this movement from the original ETA 2892A2. Now we're gonna take a look at the P01. This is a model that came out in 2019. Both of these watches were something of a, a black sheep or a black lamb, I guess you could say for their respective brands. This one was attacked as being too crassly commercial, and this one was attacked as being A, too weird, B, too large, and C, not the Tudor Submariner reissue that social media had led people to expect in 2009 when this debuted. I actually think this is the most interesting watch Tudor makes, and thank God it's not another duplicative Black Bay. They did something different and risky. Cheers to Rolex Tudor for doing something that wasn't a guaranteed success. For me, this is by far the most interesting Black Bay. It's based on a 1967 prototype developed for the U.S. military. The timepiece is actually fairly true to the original, with most of the differences being on the dial. We have a case that is, at least at face value, 42 millimeters in diameter in stainless steel. It is 14.3 millimeters thick, and then it's 55.8 millimeters lug to lug, which is exceptionally broad for a 42 millimeter watch. You can see it has a locking and unlocking system for its bi-directional rotating bezel, which you'll note is calibrated in hours rather than more conventional dive bezel minutes relock using the lug. We have double articulated strap. You can see there's a hinge and then there's a second pivot. So it's actually double articulated and that on both sides. The strap is leather on the top with a contrasting stitch, an e-crew stitch that matches the loom of the dial. Then it's rubber on the bottom and you can see the motif of the snowflake hour hand repeated in the underside of the strap. Rolling over the clasp, you can see the Tudor shield molded into the clasp top. The buckle opens up. It is a clamshell lock. There are ceramic pin snaps internally to maintain the tight tolerances over time, as steel cannot wear down the ceramic. Rolling over the case band, you can see we have a relatively severe profile. It has the look of a prototype, completely unfinished, unrefined, at least in form. The detailing is much better than that. You can see satination all the way across, the break between hoods and sides quite sharp but it does have the look of an engineering prototype, something that wasn't designed with aesthetics in mind. And that's true of the 1967 original. You could see that there are pivots for the articulated lugs, and then we have a off-centered crown that makes this watch a handy ambidextrous option. We also have a more domed crystal than is typical on a Tudor to give it a little bit more plexiglass-like off-axis distortion. We have a little bit of e-crew fotina here, which is gonna be a contentious detail, but I think it adds a little bit of warmth to the dial, which is matte finished and has these wonderful long extended minute hashes for a sort of radial dial profile, but make no mistake, the handset is designed to evoke the late 60s to mid 70s Tudor Snowflake Submariners. A nice touch is that the date disc matches the color of the loom. Underneath the case back, we have the caliber MT5612, automatic winding Tudor exclusive caliber. It's also used in the Super Ocean Heritage 2 by Breitling, but it is a Tudor or Kinesi manufactured movement. It is not a Breitling made movement. Automatic winding, 70 hour power reserve, COSC chronometer, hacking seconds, quick set date, Full balance bridge with a free sprung index, both making it a very tough shock tolerant movement. It has an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring. Now you can see the watch will wear large. When I put it on my wrist, there's absolutely no mistaking the size of this thing. It really does wear more like a 44 or even a 45. And it's the width across the wrist that makes it that kind of watch. It's big. I wouldn't wear it on a wrist smaller than mine. I think even a 15 centimeter circumference wrist, you're going to get an uncomfortable amount of overlap. And because those lugs are so enormous and striking, you're going to see the overlap expressed when people look at your wrist. It's not too thick, but then again, it's not thin either. We'll do a quick loom shot with both of these watches in the frame. As you can see, the Tudor just has more loom overall, and it's not really close in that regard. In particular, the skeletonized hands of the Omega are a little bit finer, but one feature of the Omega that does stand out is the differential loom, as the most important elements of the bezel and dial when you're diving are the minute hand and the bezel pearl, and because most of the dial on the Omega is blue, and then the minute hand and the bezel pearl are green, it's pretty easy to read the bezel relative to the minute hand, whereas on the Tudor, uh, it, it doesn't even have a luminescent pearl. So loom advantage has to go to the Omega just because the Tudor pretty much forfeits the contest. If you just want to know the time with the Tudor, you're good to go. It probably has the edge in that regard. But if you actually want to use your watch for timing at night, 
I'm covering up some of the indices there, then the omega actually takes the cake. All right, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each. So the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter Commander's Watch. This is a watch that, when new, cost $5,000 and pre-owned now costs about $6,450 to $6,500. So this watch has actually gained a little bit of value. It is more collectible because of the strict limited edition as well as the fact that the market seems to have already discovered it. What other the reservations, and I mean whatever the reservations, when this watch was new, it's become a bit of a favorite, and the fact that it's gained value, whereas almost every other Omega loses value, uh, is a testament to this watch's staying power. I think this will be better and better regarded with time, and it has that bond connection as well as the limited edition status. In terms of fit, this is an easier watch to wear in every regard. It's thinner, it's smaller, it's shorter lug to lug. Put it on the bracelet, put it on a different strap, and it pulls away in fit terms by a mile compared to the rather awkward P01. There is the display case back. This is not an artisanally finished movement, but it's attractive, handsome, and it's fun enough. I would rather be able to see the movement, especially considering this watch also has the diving depth edge. The Sapphire case back does not handicap it in any way. It's a 300 meter to the Tudor's 200 meter, and it has the helium escape valve if you do need to dive with saturation techniques. Unlikely, but it's there, and more is always better. It's also important to note that the boxed set of this absolutely slays the boxed set for this. You've got that lovely display box, inner and outer box, brass fixtures for the box, strap tool, extra accessory bracelet with all the trimmings, including a deployment clasp and a dive extension. You get the strap tool to set it up, and then you get the little ribbon to remind you of the Royal Navy heritage. Also important to note, this timepiece is probably a better option with formal attire. Throw this on an alligator leather strap and all of a sudden the more compact case, the thinner profile, you've got a watch that can shift gears and that's not the case with the Tudor. Now the Tudor, I think in the long run, this is gonna be a watch that is easier to get into. And I think that, I think the power reserve, the movement, the durability of the caliber gives it an edge. The MT5612 is built more rugged overall, thicker, more shock tolerant than the Omega. It's also longer legged with a 70 hour power reserve versus 48 with the Omega. Both watches are chronometers. Both watches, if you can find them new, have warranties of five years. This watch is an easier watch to buy new or used. $4,000 new, pre-owned, these are going for about $3,750. It's an ambidextrous watch. A lot of times with dive watches, people get worried about the crown and crown guard structure. Because of the off-centered crown here and off-centered crown guards, it's ambidextrous. The loom, if you just want to read the time, is better. It's not better for diving purposes, but it is easier to read for civilian purposes and in the dark. Ultimately, I think this watch will also be more special. I'm not sure if they will ultimately build more than 7,007 of these to compete with the numerical advantage of these, but I will say I've seen quite a few of these. These seem to be quite rare. Tudor probably has no compunctions about making lots of them, but people don't seem to be buying lots of them, which is going to keep this watch relatively scarce. And in the long run, I would say that a rare Rolex Tudor steel dive watch is going to be worth more than, well, frankly, a relatively common 7,007 piece stainless steel Seamaster Diver 300. But again, that's very speculative. Which one of these would I rather own? I'd rather own the Omega. It's easier to wear, the dial is of much higher quality, applique indices, ceramic base, lovely 007 flourishes, handsome color scheme, no fotina. Uh, this watch for me is almost unwearable. It's a party watch, a weekend watch, if you want a tool watch, but then again you have to buy an accessory strap and denude it of the leather if you want to take it diving. Here we've got Everything basically except power reserve. I like to see my movements. I like better fit. I like versatile watches that could be dress or sports watches. I'm agnostic on the James Bond connection, but the boxed set for me is a huge advantage. And to get a full accessory bracelet and clasp, I would gladly pay the premium to own the Omega. And in fact, I do own an older version of the Diver 300 meters. So you guys let me know which of these two watches, these two offbeat divers from mainstream brands, would you rather own? Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.